Silver and gold had a slightly up and sideways week in fiat US dollar price action. The gold spot price climbed a bit, closing today around the 1,288 US dollar per troy ounce level. The silver spot price is closing the week at around $15.11 per troy ounce, again in full fiat US Federal Reserve notes. With us this week, a returning guest to the show, Mr. Dave Kranzler of Investment Research Dynamics. Dave will be with us shortly to discuss precious metals and other financial market matters after this brief message from our show's sponsor. SDBullion.com is a high volume physical gold, silver, and precious metal dealer. Founded in March 2012 with the goal of providing the lowest cost bullion available, SD Bullion has become one of the largest US based precious metal dealers and is regularly recognized by Inc. Magazine as one of America's fastest growing companies. Having now served over 100,000 customers around the world with over 10,000 positive online reviews, SD Bullion continues to gain industry market share by being one of the premier low cost options for physical precious metal bullion buyers and sellers. At sdbullion.com, you can order your guaranteed physical precious metal bullion products online, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Discreet, low-cost delivery is both fast and always fully insured. You can also choose to purchase various qualifying gold and silver IRA products, which can be held in your individual retirement account for long-term wealth preservation. We are committed to being your trusted source for low-cost, highest quality, investment-grade bullion products. Visit sdbullion.com for more information. Welcome to this week's Metals and Markets Wrap. I'm your host, James Anderson of SD Bullion. With us today, Friday, April 26, 2019 at noon Eastern, is returning guest Dave Kranzler of Investment Research Dynamics. Dave, thanks for coming back on the show. Oh, thanks for having me again. I love doing the show with you. Well, Dave, last time we spoke, it was uh, December 21st, 2018, and that was... Uh, you know, basically the stock market had dropped roughly 20%. Uh, there was a lot of people freaking out in the U.S. stock market about what was happening. It was dropping precipitous, precipitously for a few weeks. And uh, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin came to, uh, came to the uh, aid of the stock market by tweeting out on Christmas Eve uh, that he had made some phone calls to the major heads of the uh, commercial banks. And since then, we've had a nice, sharp V recovery. Uh, and basically recovered all those losses. Uh, the stock market is now at new all-time highs, and uh, looks like the uh, you know everything's good for the bulls. And I, but you know you yourself have been doubting it. Uh, myself too, obviously. I'm being a little bit sarcastic here. Uh, you recently described the current stock market as the most dangerous stock market you've seen in your 34 plus year career as a financial market professional. Could you maybe go into that? Describe. I mean, just even in the basics, like what is the potential upside right now for the U.S. stock market versus the downside? Uh, just even that that idea of how high, how much higher could this even go and how much lower could it go if things go wrong? Um, maybe maybe elaborate on that and maybe the disconnect that we really are currently seeing. Sure. Um, I mean, I was day trading the dot coms back in 99 and 2000. And I mean... It, it seemed like you get out of bed every morning and you know the Nasdaq would be up five percent. I mean, it just seemed that way day after day after day. I was like, is there I mean, could it go up ad infinitum? Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's what it felt like. and that's that's kind of what it it started to feel like over the last couple of weeks, especially with the the tech stocks and specifically the semiconductors. And it's you know it, it's it's kind of the same thing now as it was back then where people you know day traders and hedge funds whatever um you know retail guys who decide they want to get in on the action they they don't even care they all they care about is tickers 
Mm-hmm. And if the ticker's moving higher, they're throwing money at it. And it, it becomes a game of, it's, it's very similar to the Dutch tulip bulb phenomenon, <laughs> where all of a sudden, you know, it's just, it's crowd psychology and you're just t- chasing the momentum higher and you're hope it's a game of musical chairs. You're hoping that, you know, you can buy a stock and a couple hours later sell it at a higher price, mm-hmm. you know, and it, it just kind of snowballs from there. And what exacerbates the situation now versus, you know, 1999 and early 2000 is that the hedge fund computer algorithm trading is such a dominant percentage of the trading volume now. Mm. And I, I just I still laugh at this because when the stock market was, you know, I would argue that what happened really from October to Christmas Day or Christmas Eve and, you know, the, the, the brunt of it was in December was that all of a sudden, you know, the computer algos decided to introduce price discovery, you know, bona fide price discovery into stocks. And I thought it was funny because all of a sudden you had all these market ex- experts coming out and whining about hedge fund computers. You know, you never hear about the computers when the market's going irrationally straight up. Mm-hmm. When it's selling off, it's it's the hedge fund computers. The what really put me over the edge was there's an article in the Wall Street Journal that featured Leon Cooperman. Leon Cooperman is a he's an old time Wall Street guy. He was he was you know made his initial money at Goldman Sachs, then went out on his own. And he did an interview in that article, and he was blaming the down, you know, the sell-off on the computers. Well, it's funny he hasn't said a peep about the market going straight up mm-hmm. because it's essentially been a V recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, in within that V recovery, the 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 U.S. economic activity, notwithstanding today's phony GDP number, has been going, you know, at a 45 degree angle south. And I'm seeing that in all the numbers that I look at when I when I scour, you know, the the Internet for for information that I use in my short sellers journal. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's it's one of those things. I forget who said it, maybe like Irving Fisher, I think, back in the 20s, you know, that the the stock market can remain irrational for longer than than an investor can say solvent. He was referencing shorts. So, Mm -hmm. um you know, at some point, and I don't know what the catalyst is going to be that'll trigger it, but at some point, it'll. And this is what happened in, I think it was March of 2000 when the market, the Nasdaq started going straight south. It was either March or April. I'd have to look at a chart, but um, it, it was like it felt like it was going to go up forever, and then all of a sudden, it was like the music stopped, and it was like a Roman candle that ran out of out of gunpowder and just started falling for no reason. Hmm. Well, there is a reason. It's because everything is irrationally overvalued. And so, I mean, in that sense, I would argue that the bubble that's been blown this time in the stock market is far more insidious and far more dangerous than the one that was blown back in 99 and 2000. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I guess one counterpoint to that would be it certainly is dangerous. uh, But as you see them intervening so quickly... I mean, it, the fact that it dropped 20 percent from October to the Christmas Eve, the fact that Mnuchin comes out and has to make a comment on the damn thing is it just shows you how fragile and how ridiculous and how quick they are to intervene. Right. So do you think investors out there are literally thinking like, you know what, they got our backs no matter what, even if there is a slight crash, they'll come in and intervene and prop this thing up and it won't be that big of a downside or risk for me. I wouldn't describe what's happening right now as a process of investors thinking. <laughs> it's really just computers and day traders reacting to upward price momentum. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it, there's no doubt that, see, I, I, it's funny because the Federal Reserve can't buy stocks. It's it, when, you know, when you see like the market stop on a dime from going down and all of a sudden do a, you know, do a V uh, rise higher. It's not the Federal Reserve per se. It's it's the Exchange Stabilization Fund, mm-hmm. which is a subsidiary of the Treasury. Mm-hmm. Now, the the chairman of the FOMC, you know, chairman of the Fed, act happens to have a seat on the board of the Working Group on Financial Markets that oversees the Exchange Stabilization Fund. Mm-hmm. And so, and that's why Mnuchin said, well, he's going to call the the heads, the CEOs of the major banks because they're all part of the working group on financial markets. Mm-hmm. You know, he couldn't say, I'm going to call the Fed. Right. You know, 
it's been amusing watching Trump and Kudlow beat the crap out of Powell. You know, they're just they're they're beating him like a redheaded stepchild, and it's hilarious. And he just sits there and takes it. You know, and and I mean, I suppose there's probably a gray area argument that you could legally make that that Trump and Kudlow should be keeping their mouth shut about what interest rate policy should be or whether or not the Fed should be printing money. Mm -hmm. But as long as that buying is contained in the exchange stabilization fund, you know, there's nothing you can do about the intervention. Now, at some point, they're going to they're not going to be able to the algos are going to reverse and they're not going to be able to stop it. Mm. You know, unless they turn off the markets, which we've seen a couple times. There's been some pretty sharp drops over the last three months. And mysteriously, the NYSE has an order filling program problem mm -hmm. or, you know, one of the NASDAQ ECNs breaks down, mm -hmm. you know, and it's it's not coincidental. It's 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 intentional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, at some point it, it is, you know, the rug's going to be pulled out from under this and we're going to get another sharp drop. And, you know, again, I would my bad. You know, I don't know. I, I would say. It'll it'll fall at a certain point beyond the control of the exchange stabilization fund, and then as the as the as the energy of the selling subsides, that's when they'll come back in. If you happen to notice, so you can run a chart that goes back to August of 2015, and that's when the S and P started having sharp drops. Yeah. You know, and each each drop has been, well, I think the the one in December from March for, or from October to Christmas Eve. I think that was. Uh, mid mid to high teens percentage drop, but the drops prior to that had been you know around eight to ten percent in the S and P, but then a V recovery, mm -hmm. and I I think the act the, the the ultimate motive for keeping the stock market from true price discovery in those cases has been to save the pensions yeah. because yeah. because if if you know and I have a buddy who works at a pension fund who did a study. And he concluded that because of the degree to which every single public pension fund, except, I don't know, either Alaska or Montana, I forget, there's one or two that are technically aren't underfunded. But he said that um, if the S&P drops for more than 10 percent for an extended period, meaning it stays, you know, down 10 percent or more for, say, more than three to four months, you're going to have pensions start to collapse. Yeah. And so that's. That's why I theorize that you see these V recoveries when you have a sharp sell off. Right. Yeah. It's it's you know, almost a, a question of, of of maintaining control and and keeping the pensions at least somewhat solvent. Right. And you know the the sell offs that we've had starting in August of 2015. I mean, they've only stayed down 10 percent or more for a few weeks, and then all of a sudden they start climbing higher. Yeah. And so. At some point, and I don't know, again, I don't know what's going to cause it, trigger it, whatever. At some point, you know, I think they're going to have much more trouble trying to, to prop the market up, kind of like as, you know, what happened in um, 2008 mm. to, you know, through April of 2009. Mm. And a, a big part of that's going to be, you know, the, the, the derivatives are going to start failing again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a ton of derivatives defaults, and and that's where I think the real problem was in two thousand, late two thousand and eight. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So since we last spoke, let's turn to gold and silver. Um, since we last spoke, gold and silver markets, you know, at the beginning of twenty nineteen, performed pretty well. They were they were rising and showing some strength, especially in gold. Uh, but the prices are roughly just a little bit higher than when we spoke uh, December twenty first. What do you, what have you been seeing in those markets since we last spoke? What 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 have you been uh, noticing? Any any changes or anything that's uh, of note? Well, you know, again, I think the I think the price capping by the banks has been about as intense as I've ever seen it. Hmm. And you'll start to get a nice move higher in gold, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, boom, you'll get a Comex. Uh, you'll get a price rate on the COMEX, and they usually they usually seem to happen on Friday after most of the rest of the world is is uh, you know hung hung up their cleats for the weekend. Uh, there was one I don't know it was like three or four weeks ago, and and uh, Craig Hemke wanted to interview me about that because he was really pissed off about it, as was I because it was just so blatant mm -hmm. and. Um, and so, you know, to me, it's it's the mark of manipulation. And I think what they're trying to do, because we saw a similar behavior, although not as extreme, back in um, 
early 2008, you know, through the through the summer of 2008, they took the price of gold down from, you know, something like 12, 1200 to 700. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and that was in the face of Bear Stearns collapsing, the imminent collapse of Lehman, you know, a lot of fundamental events were happening that that you you know would have led you to believe that the price of gold should be soaring mm -hmm. well they held that off until they they were able to hold off that soaring event until they announced the the money printing mm -hmm. I, I don't even like calling it quantitative easing because it's money printing right right like to, to, to call it you know quantitative easing is like calling a garbage collector a sanitation engineer right, right. <laughs> it's it's money printing and now they're going to leave most of it in the system per per the the latest you know FOMC policy shift yeah, so right. call quantitative easing is an absolute joke um, but at any rate you know if they were just if the banks just said okay let's let price discovery take over the gold and silver market the, the price of gold would start climbing you know just every day mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't stop it would and it might not go up in chunks of hundred dollars but it would just keep grinding higher and it might it might reset you know up upward pretty quickly initially mm -hmm. and then you would have people who watch this say well if the price of gold is going higher how can things be so great mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sure yeah and, and so that's that's what they're doing they're 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 trying to you know keep the canary out of the coal mine because if you see the canary die then the miners are going to leave the coal mine, right? Right, right. And, and that's that's the game being played. It's so, a it's a perception management game that's going on currently. Exactly. It's it's completely Orwellian, mm -hmm. um, and it's completely you know it's it's an attempt to just keep control over the system. Well, at some point that's going to fall apart as well. Now, the latest price takedown that's that's kind of taken the price of gold from thirteen hundred down to um, I don't know where did it. Where did it bottom out a few days ago? Twelve seventy-five, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, what's happened is is that again, just like the hedge funds use algos to trade the stock market and trade stock futures, they also do the same thing with COMEX futures. Mm -hmm. And so if if and and the banks know where where the trigger points are in terms of stop losses. So if the banks if the banks can get the the hedge funds the hedge fund algos to shift from you know, buying on dips and chasing the market higher into selling on rallies and shorting the market lower, then it's 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 kind of a subtle way for the banks to, to manipulate the market. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we've seen over the last couple of weeks. And it's kind of verified by the setup in the commitment of traders report, because in the last couple of weeks, you've seen the banks, I mean, the hedge funds shift from an, a very net long position, you know, where they're you know, they're 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 long the long side of their contract book far outweighs the, the short positions right. in aggregate. Well now they're extremely short, or at least they were as of the last COT report. Mm -hmm. Um they, they had shifted to being extremely short gold and silver futures, net sh on a net short basis. And to me what that tells me is that the the last, you know, Twenty twenty-five dollar push downward in the price of gold was the hedge funds, hedge fund algos just shorting the crap out of the market, chasing the momentum lower. Especially once the fifty-day moving average was broken, because mm -hmm. that's that's usually a technical trigger point for momentum traders. So, mm -hmm. and I think that's what's happened. Now, what's interesting is <clears throat> this week we've had a nice nice bounce in the price of gold. I mean, it's. It's up to 12.90 right now on a on a front month contract basis. Mm -hmm. It's up over 10 bucks today, um, but the last couple of days the dollar has been moving higher. I mean, right. it's it's been up pretty sharply, but so is the price of gold. Yeah, yeah, that is an interesting thing. Period, I think the price of gold rose about six or seven bucks. And ordinarily you would say, well, shouldn't gold be moving in inversely to the to the dollar? And what I think might have happened, and it kind of coincided with the emerging market foreign exchange plunge that we saw a couple of days ago, you know, it, it feels to me like something might have broke somewhere in the world. And you were you were kind of seeing a flight to safety into the dollar and into gold at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and then today, I think the dollar is is getting hit and and gold's got a nice bounce. I mean, if, if we stay on this trajectory, we'll be back over 1300 next week. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
So um, as far as the dollar, what are you seeing? Are you, I mean, there's, are you still, I mean, there's still a camp out there who thinks the dollar is going to strengthen further. Um, are you, what, are you, what are you thinking about the dollar for the, for the, you know, I'd say the short to medium term? What are you thinking in terms of U.S. dollar strength or weakness? I mean, quite honestly, I, you know, I loosely follow the dollar index. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just generically, I think the dollar is extremely overvalued, mm -hmm. you know, just based on the financial condition of the United States relative to other countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, you can say, well, China has all this corporate and banking system debt and government debt and and yeah, and then but then you know you, you counter that by saying, well, first of all, they've got 1.2 trillion in foreign reserves, so that means they're diversified in several different currencies. The U.S. I haven't looked in a long time, but the last time I looked, the the um, U.S. foreign reserve was something like 38 billion. It's nothing. Yeah, it's all gold and it's all marked to market at like 35 bucks an ounce. I think right now still, uh, you know, that, that maybe most of their reserves are in gold and, and it's at a cheap price that they have it on the books. Right. And the, the foreign reserve number that China reports, that's just currencies, I believe. I don't think mm -hmm. they count gold in that number. No. But notwithstanding that, I mean, China's got a massive amount of gold, the, the central bank there, and it's, it's a lot more than what they officially report, and everyone who follows it knows and understands that. Mm -hmm. You know, and same with Russia. Mm -hmm. I mean, Russia's sovereign debt is, is something like 30% or 20% of its GDP, as opposed to the U.S., right. where Treasury debt is, you know, what, 105, 110% of GDP, and that doesn't include the guaranteed uh, mortgage debt, mm -hmm. Freddie, Freddie and Fannie, etc. Mm -hmm. So um, if you just look at the U.S. balance sheet versus some of the other major industrial companies, I mean, the U.S. is a mess. Yeah. And on that basis is why I, I would argue that the dollar is extremely overvalued. Mm -hmm. And not only that, I mean, there's a lot of dollars that are held all around the world and, and countries are starting to divest themselves of that dollar. So yeah. Short term, I don't know what the dollar is going to do. I'm, if something, if things are starting to break around the world in the financial system, you're probably going to see a, a, a push higher in the dollar just because it's a knee-jerk flight to safety vehicle. Right. But you'll see the same thing in gold. And, and usually there's been a few periods of time when the dollar and gold have moved higher in tandem and then the dollar starts to tank. And those, those periods where they move in tandem um, – it, it, they usually precede, you know, some of gold's best periodic rate of returns over the last 20 years. So mm -hmm. that's that's still what my outlook is at this point. So as far as uh, precious metal mining companies, are you currently positioning yourself in any of these days? And uh, if you wouldn't mind, I mean, the listeners out there, I'm sure they'd be interested in any names you may uh, you may mention. Sure. Um, I mean, I like to try and keep most of my ideas proprietary sure. to my Mining Stock Journal subscriber. But, you know, I've written articles about some of these companies and put them on my blog or Seeking Alpha or whatever. So I don't I don't mind sharing a, a couple names. Um, you know, first off, I'd just like to preface it by saying, you know, the if you look at the GDX index and the GDX index for at least the last six months has outperformed the Dow. I was, I was running some numbers yesterday and I bet. I can't remember what exactly my time frame was. It was either year to date or the last, I don't know, the last six months or something. And so, you know, there's been a, a, a quiet bull trend in the larger cap mining stocks. Mm -hmm. The juniors, especially the junior exploration segment, which, you know, those are the companies that are essentially like public venture capital companies, mm -hmm. right? They they need they need you know continued flow of, of investment in order to, to, you know, try and prove a discovery on their properties. So those, those stocks have been woefully underperforming the entire sector. But I mean, you know, if you believe in the sector, the junior exploration stocks are, are about as cheap as I've seen them relative to the price of gold and relative to the large cap mining stocks as they were in, in December of 2015. And and in 2001, which is when I started in the sector. So, you know, just in terms of a relative value investment, you know, the junior mining stocks are about as 
cheap as anything out there. And I'm not talking about the stocks that are in the GDXJ because those are, you know, I, I think the I think the average market cap is around 600 million. I'm talking about, or maybe not quite that high, at least a couple hundred million. But um, uh, I'm talking about the stocks that have, you know, a 20 million dollar market cap. And one example of one is is U.S. Gold, hmm. and they've got a a big property that sits in the Cortez trend in Nevada. And um, the, the chief geologist of the company thinks that, he, he said this particular, the geology of this property is, is probably the most promising project that he's ever seen in his, in his career. And he made some big, big, big discoveries for Newmont in Nevada when he was the head geologist at Newmont. And um, he also was, was led the team that made the, the um, railroad discovery for Gold Standard Ventures. So, um, and this particular property sits about 10 miles south of American Barracks Cortez Hills Complex, which is one of the larger gold mines in the world. And I think it produces know, something like a million and a half ounces a year. It's it's. It's the official resource, I think, is 15 million ounces, but Dave told me that, you know, geologists who have seen that property think it's got well over 20 million ounces on it in total. Mm -hmm. um, but at any rate, so they're just now starting, you know, they're, they're just beyond the initial exploratory uh, drilling stage on, on the Keystone project, and they're gonna start up drilling again in early June and you know this is this is the type of stock where you know if they have one drill hole that shows a discovery i mean this stock could easily double or triple mm -hmm. and if if the project is what dave matthewson thinks it might be i mean this is a you know eventually a ten dollar stock over time yeah what is it trading at right now um closed at a dollar i don't even look at it every day yeah because it's just it's at a dollar eleven right now. Okay. Um, they also have another. Uh, they've got a property in Wyoming, the Copper King project, and it's a copper gold uh, deposit. And they're in the process of polishing that up. And at some point, they're going to sell it. But it, the company's been offered. You know, I think within the last two years, they're offered ten million bucks for it. But that was that was kind of a, a, a stink bid by mm -hmm. some entity that was looking to pick up cheap properties a couple years ago. Um, but if you assume it's worth somewhere between 15 and 20 million as is, I mean, the market cap of the stock <laughs> is 20 million. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. essentially, you know, to me, you, you're, you're buying it for the intrinsic value of the, of the company at a dollar 10. And then you've got the optionality upside of the Keystone project, which is tremendous. Right. Yeah. So I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you to close out the interview. Uh, I know that last time we spoke, we touched upon it because it's uh, just an intriguing and interesting story. It kind of relates to this entire hated bull market in the stock market. Uh, I wanted to ask you what you've been seeing over at uh, Tesla with Elon Musk and the saga that uh, that's continuing on with him. What have you been seeing of late or since we last spoke in uh, <laughs> December of 2018? Sure. Um, just real quickly, just, you know, because I droned on about U.S. gold. That's no I problem. Also just wanted to mention, um, I also presented a couple weeks ago uh, New Gold, NGD, as a turnaround oh. story. Okay. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of these situations where I think they're going to get the company turned around, the, the Rainy River project. You know, they got to really chop expenses there. And, you know, it's the mine has only been operating for about a year and a half or two years, and, and sometimes mines can be. It's not like, you know, it's not like producing, you know, semiconductor chips where it's just completely automated and smooth running. You know, a smooth continuous function. I mean, operating a gold mine is is I call it a lumpy manufacturing process. You know, sometimes, you know, it it it, it works seamlessly and flawlessly and, and then other times you run into problems right. whether it's mechanical or you hit a patch of ore that's not as high grade as, as you were expecting so um, you know they've, they've had issues the bottom line is they basically overpaid for Rainy River at the time when they bought it and then they've got another property that they also overpaid for at the time that they bought it and they've written both of those down significantly and I think you're at the point now 
where, you know, instead of disappointing investors every quarter, I think they've written them both down enough so that, and, and they've lowered expectations enough so that um, going forward they'll be able to um, beat play the beat the earnings game instead of you know miss the earnings problem. Yeah. So, yeah. so that should be um, helpful in the stock price, I would presume. Yeah, and if, if they can get Rainy River turned around, this company is going to be producing a lot of gold, and especially if we get a higher gold price, this thing will be very profitable. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think I think starting in 2020 is when they think they can get Rainy River cash flow positive again. So I just think it's an interesting turnaround play, mm-hmm. and um, we uh, we own it in my fund as well. So um, as far as Elon Musk goes, I mean, I think everyone knows by now that that the first quarter earnings were a complete disaster. I mean, they were worse than than, you know, even the most pessimistic of the large, large, you know, brokerage firm analysts were were thinking would happen. Mm -hmm. Um, What kind of cracked me up, what I think is just as funny as as, you know, kind of the the spectacle that Elon Musk has become. I mean, he's certainly the modern day P.T. Barnum. But uh, there's an analyst, the auto analyst for Wedbush Security, a guy named Dan Ives, and he's been around the street, and he's been the most ardent Tesla bull recently. You know, at one point he had a price target of like 440 bucks, mm-hmm. and then he took it down, I think, to 370. Well, he issued a statement yesterday, which essentially implied that he doesn't think Elon Musk is going to be able to get Tesla profitable, mm-hmm. and yet he only takes his price target down to 275. You know, it's like, why are you assigning a forty-six billion dollar market cap, not including the the eleven, twelve billion dollars of debt they have on the company? Why are you assigning a forty-six billion dollar market cap to this company when you don't think they'll ever be profitable? Yeah, I mean, it's just it's it's absurd. I mean, yeah. to me, Tesla is is emblematic of the fraud, corruption, counting games. Um, perception, perception management. <laughs> yeah, Again. perception yeah. management that you know, and also representative of the extreme degree to which the U.S. stock market is just in a bubble. Yeah, I mean, I don't even think Tesla is worth the face value of the debt on the company, mm-hmm. especially when you look at their sales trend. And I just read a report today that said in Europe the Jaguar I-Pace and the Audi e-tron. And the e-tron is just now starting to roll out. Those two vehicles together are out selling the Teslas five to one. Hmm. Wow. You know, and so you know, and Elon Musk, you know, said is still sticking to this idea that he's going to be producing five hundred thousand vehicles by the end of the year at that run rate. He said, well, with the Shanghai factory, we'll probably be producing at a rate of five hundred thousand a year by the end of the year. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, you sold sixty three thousand cars in the first quarter. You know, you're selling cars at a 252,000 uh, annual run rate, and your sales trend is going south. It's not going up. Right. If you produce 500,000 cars, who the hell is going to buy them? Right. <laughs> so, I, I mean, you know, Tesla's getting hammered again today. It's down 5.7 percent. Um, we're apparently closing in on the level where I've I've read that. Um, Musk starts getting margin calls. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's, it's, it's just a matter of time for this thing to unwind. Um, you know, I think Fidelity and T Row probably realize they're stuck. They're the second and third largest holders. Um, I'll be curious to see when the mutual fund holdings are released. I think they should be released. I don't know in about two weeks to see how their positions shifted or changed or if they reduced them. And then there's this Bailey Gifford. It's a it's a London-based money management firm, and they they're by far the largest holder. I think they're stuck, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. So I mean, you know, I think at, at one at one point we're going to wake up and Tesla's going to be trading under a hundred bucks, and mm-hmm. you know, it's it's, it's going to be one of these things where, and I think that's what's going to happen with the entire market, where all of a sudden you'll wake up and it's going down in step functions as opposed to continuous line yeah well Dave uh, I really appreciate you coming on on behalf of our listeners I want to give you the chance to let them know how they can find you uh, and and what types of uh, services you offer over at your website sure just real quickly my website is investmentresearchdynamics.com and uh, there you can find links that that describe my short sellers journal and my mining stock journal the Short Sellers Journal is uh, a weekly 
newsletter that I send out, and the Mining Stock Journal is is twice a month. I I just sent the latest issue out last night, coincidentally. Um, and you know, in terms of a minimum requirement for subscription period, it's it's beyond the first month. There's no minimum requirement. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, Dave, thank you so much for coming on this week, and uh, hopefully we can talk sooner than later. Yeah, that sounds great, James. Thanks for having me on. It was great catching up with you. Yeah, Dave, always a pleasure.